data protection. Why operators should continue to take data protection issues seriously. Moderated by Patrick Massa, WH Partners. With Gordon Grek, Arcafort, Adriana Minovich, Betson, Yannick Sant, MGA, and Ian Deguara, Office of the Information and Data Protection Commissioner, Malta. Thank you all for joining us for this last panel of our regulation and compliance conference. So, during this panel, we shall discuss the challenges arising from the interplay between the general data protection regulation and other areas of law which gaming operators are subject to, such as um, responsible gambling and anti-money laundering requirements. Um, with me today, I have a very interesting panel, uh, Mr. Ian Daguara, the um, Information and Data Protection Commissioner, Dr. Yannick Hassan, General Counsel at the Malta Gaming Authority, um, Adriana Minovic, Head of Privacy at Betsy Group, and Gordon Gregg, co-founder at Arcafort. So, um, as we know, in applying certain principles of the GDPR, gaming operators need to be mindful of responsible gambling and AML requirements, which may overlap and to a certain extent conflict with the GDPR. For example, um, the principle of transparency. So on one side we have um, the GDPR stipulating that operators need to be, um, uh, need to provide players with clear and specific information about all processing activities. Whereas on the other hand, we have um, anti-money laundering laws, which essentially prohibit the disclosure of any information relating to ongoing investigations. Um, similarly, with respect to responsible gambling, operators need to be very careful when um, disclosing information relating to the monitoring of players, because this, this might enable players to bypass RG mechanisms which at the end of the day should be in place and should not be disclosed in a transparent way, enabling players to, to basically bypass them. Um, so my first question, I think we can start with, with Adriana. Um, Adriana, do you see any other potential clashes between these different areas of law? And what do you think operators should keep in mind in order to strike a balance between these different requirements? Hi, Patrick, thanks. Well, uh, first, uh, I have to say that when I started in this industry, it's three years ago, I came from a bit different background. I was also working in a lot of regulated industries, but in the industries where GDPR was going hand in hand with the regulatory requirements as pharmaceutical, telco, and it's completely different perspective because somehow you are following the same principles and the, and the, the, the spirit of the industry is practically going in the hand-to-hand -hand with GDPR. And then starting in the gambling industry, at the beginning, you constantly start hearing the people from the compliance, the people from business, you know, scary story. No, we need to comply with this. These are our licensing obligations. Our business depends on this. So... Somehow it was very difficult when the GDPR started and the implementation, you know, to prove your case for GDPR, why, you know, you should impose certain, let's say, limitations and restrictions and certain requirements that would bring a bit more clarity, uh, as you mentioned. But uh, after already three years working on the in implementation of GDPR and, of course, other compliance areas, I would say that GDPR proved to be, at least from the perspective of the operators, a good tool to challenge the other areas and to ask uh, right questions. You know, do we really need this data? Why we need it? What is the underlying purpose? You said that we need to collect it based on the law. Okay, show me where in the law this is said. So somehow from my perspective, uh, I would say that today GDPR brought uh, common sense really in the in the other areas to really the question 
where are the, the limits of the operators in exercising their obligations and where we need to draw the line. And I think we saw even um, in different panels this morning, many of the speakers mentioned the very interesting issues from the privacy. And this development we can see especially in the UK with the new VAP guidance, which are practically requiring that you start understanding your financial, emotional, and other problems of your VAP customers in order to make good, responsible gambling judgments. Uh, Sweden, as mentioned on the previous panel, where practically regulators are asking a bit more proactive approach in even collecting health data of the customers in order to do the proper RG assessments. Sorry, <laughs> and thanks. <laughs> and even a single customer view, which we mentioned also this morning, uh, which will be quite interesting exercise, especially for us people in privacy area to see uh, how much we can really collect and share personal data in order to fill the regulatory guidelines. And I think in that regard, we, we did a quite a significant step because from the beginning where the UK Gambling Commission expected from the operators to take this as the uh, self-regulatory approach, here is the task and you find a way how you will share very delicate data between you as the operators and do the analytic. We at least move step forward where uh, we got involved with the ICO and ICO will develop this tool within the sandbox where we will practically question can we do this in this form, or we really need some more clear legal basis, whether this should be defined in the law and how it should be defined and etc. So I would say that today we can see that especially GDPR started to be a proper balance in the field of the proactive measures that are required from the operators, especially in the responsible gambling area, but also AML. And just to conclude, um, I think um, one thing that we were all hoping somehow um, is in the AML area, because we know that the uh, forthcoming revision of the AML directive is soon coming um, into place and to be discussed. And recently I saw the new proposal of the AMR regulation because we all know that there was a lot of discussion between the European Data Protection Board and the relevant AML institutions on the European level about the use of data for AML purposes. And somehow we were all hoping to feel, see finally, you know, the proper clarification in the new AML regulation. And unfortunately, I have to be a bit skeptic because what the new text of the regulation practically said is that um, giving a blanket approach for using special categories of data for AML purposes with any particular instructions. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that this will put a lot more burden on the operators because in the end of the day, we need to understand that here we are discussing in two areas regulatory obligations and data protection and privacy considerations on the other side that are conflicting to each other. And uh, when we need to discuss about something that is restricting fundamental rights and even some basic principles in the data protection area, I'm afraid that uh, unfortunately this is not the place for the operators to set the limits here we need a bit more um, define guidance how to implement this. I mean, luckily, this panel here, which take a place, is a good example because Malta was one of the first countries who introduced, if I'm not um, mistaken, in 2018 guidance of the GDPR applied in the gambling industry. But unfortunately, I cannot say that this is the practice in the other countries, especially in the other countries where we see quite proactive approach from the gambling regulators in the sense what operators should do toward the customers in AML and responsible gambling area. Thank you, Adriana. Um, Janneke, as rightly noted by Adriana, you were very much involved in the drafting of the guidance note, which the MGA issued back in 2018, relating to the application of the GDPR to the gambling industry. Um, do you, and I'm sure you do, Get, get a lot of questions relating to these potential overlaps and conflicts between these different areas of law. Um, what, what, what is your view on this topic? 
Yes, short answer. And uh, in fact, that's exactly why we decided to go down the route of enacting these guidelines um, together with the help of the IDPC, particularly Ian, and luckily he's here today. Uh, we came up with the, these guidelines precisely because operators were unsure as to how to apply GDPR in practice to their industry. There were queries regarding certain conflicts, um, but I dare say they were apparent conflicts. I mean, the, whoever is a bit well-versed with the GDPR knows that there are bases on which one can process data. One of the bases is legal obligation. And lucky or not, but our gaming law sets out very clearly certain legal obligations that operators need to abide by. For example, one conflict that uh, operators were concerned with was um, the fact that operators need to build a player profile, track player activity, essentially keep all the data they can about that player in order for them to build a proper profile. And on the other hand, GDPR remain, uh, mandates the principle of data minimization. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the two are in conflict. I mean, it is an obligation that operators have to, to harvest that data, to gather that data, to build a player profile, so to create data about that player. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's in conflict with GDPR. Exactly as Adriana said, GDPR is supposed to make operators question what data are they keeping unnecessarily. And this is a very data-heavy industry. I mean, this industry has been using data even for marketing purposes. It's no excuse. I mean, this industry classifies players as VIP players, uh, players that get specific attention. Now, what we're saying here is that data you use to build a player profile for player protection purposes, but do not keep any data that is unnecessary. So beyond that, that is required by law. And then there are other bases, of course, on which one can process data. But that's exactly why uh, back in 2018, together with the IDPC, we went on this venture, in a sense, to create these guidelines. Uh, I think they served um, the purpose at the time. Three years have passed since then. I can't believe it. I remember the run up to GDPR and everyone was, like, was really scared of this, of this D-Day and it's been three years. And I think the industry has matured. and. Uh, it's found its own way of applying the principles of GDPR to its, to its work. I, I Hopefully, and that was the whole point at the time, these guidelines will be redundant in a sense because the industry will get used to the application of, of the law to, to their jobs. So, um, but, but that's exactly why we had embarked on that. Thank you, Yannicka. Um, Ian, um, how do you think operators should strike the right balance. What principles should they keep in mind when they are faced with um, the principle of storage limitation and the GDPR? But then obviously they have to be mindful of obligations arising from anti-money laundering or other, other issues of legitimate interest. Um, what are your views? So first of all, uh, thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon, everyone. I, I acknowledge, yes, that there is indeed uh, um, this kind of tension between uh, the various laws, and uh, particular GDPR, AML, uh, RG, you know. So because uh, at times they could be seen as they are pulling in the opposite direction. For instance, GDPR is um, uh, invoking the principles of data minimization and storage limitation, whereas AML and perhaps even RG is uh, placing an obligation on uh, operators, subject persons, controllers, to collect information. But um, my, my advice is this one. There shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all approach, because that will be the problem. If you take, I mean, you, the operators, or other, other controllers, adopt um, a, a cautious approach, you know, so let's collect everything about everyone, because I mean, we will fulfill our AML um, uh, requirements and uh, let's leave GDPR on the side. That will create problems because um, it is actually the industry which knows their business operations. It's not the regulators which know the, the business operations. So we can issue guidelines. The guidelines will assist you. But still, you are the people on the ground who know the data, which categories of data you need to collect, whether you need special categories of data. 
um, for how long to retain? I mean, even though there are uh, time frames set out by law, speak about AML, so there is a legal time frame, but still it can uh, leave some leeway because the minimum is five years. It could be extended up to 10 years, you know? So, and the more information that is being collected and retained, at least from a GDPR point of view, is increasing the risks. So the more data you collect, it is, you, it is exposing you to more risks. And therefore, that is why we speak about data minimization. That's why we speak about proportionality. That is why we speak about storage limitations, because all these principles have to be ingrained in the system. And that is why, by law, whoever is subject to AML is required to appoint an MLRO. Whoever um, conducts uh, regular systematic processing in terms of GDPR, they have to appoint a DPO. They are, have to, these positions have to be appointed for a reason, not just to have a DPO. I believe that um, uh, in the case of uh, our colleague, I mean, she knows well, because there must be this kind of synergy between these positions. There should be an open channel of communication because if the MLRO will consider that we need this information in order because uh, we need to uh, conduct enhanced due diligence, for instance, in this case, but do we need to conduct enhanced due diligence in the other case for the other categories of data? So that is where the two um, positions, you know, um, should meet. They should discuss, they should reach um, and devise policies, you know, which are beneficial to the industry. Um, I, we spoke about the tensions about these, but then on the other hand, I also, I also see um, certain similarities and commonalities because, I mean, if we speak about AML and GDPR, they are, both of them are based on a risk-based approach. They are both based on a compliance program. So you must have these compliance programs. You must have the policies. You must provide training to your staff. If we speak about a risk-based approach, you have to conduct a risk assessment. So a risk assessment is there for you to identify the risk and therefore take the necessary measures and safeguards. That is why I started uh, with the no one size fits all. So because if we adopt that approach, then I, in my view, that is uh, starting on the wrong footing. And therefore, that might create problems. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, Gordon, moving on to you. Your business primarily does not act as a data controller within the gaming industry. However, you act mainly as a data processor um, in servicing your clients within the gambling industry. So as a data processor, what are the main challenges which you face in your operations? Thank you very much, Patrick, and good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, so basically, we believe that um, regulatory compliance and data protection is a shared responsibility, right? Um, so all involved parties need to be aware of what is expected, what the best practices, what the guidelines are, and so on and so forth. Um, and we as data processors act very much within um, GDPR, right? So all of our operations, um, pretty much all activities that we do take GDPR into consideration, but we're, we're very much scoped as processors, right? So we don't necessarily have all of the visibility and we don't interact on a day-to-day -day basis with AML and with RG, for example. Um, so I believe that um, better clarity and maybe more communication um, between the data controller and the data processor are obviously required um, in order to kind of where, where there's areas of overlap between GDPR and AML, for example, um, we as processors would be in a better position um, to kind of, for example, when it comes to storage limitation or minimization or anonymization of this data, um, do it in a way that is more complete, taking all of these different regulations into perspective. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Um, our time is soon up, but before we wrap up, I'd like to get a brief comment from you in relation to the Code of Conduct, which EGBA, the European Gaming and Betting Association, has developed, um, which seeks to reinforce the sector's compliance with the GDPR, 
Um, I'd like to get your views as to your general um, thoughts about the code of conduct and whether it will actually address these issues of um, interpretation and maybe overlaps between different laws. Adriana? Yes, well, uh, I have to say that uh, I've been very honored to be a part of the working group who drafted the Code of Conduct, so I naturally consider this very necessary in each industry, because in the end of the day, as much as we expect from regulator to understand our side of the story, we also need to be active participants that will explain to the regulators what are our concerns, and I think the Code of Conduct is the best place to do that. In the end of the day, it's developed together with relevant authorities, so we all have the opportunity to present our side of the story and even to discuss the, you know, the disputable issues. So I think this is something that for sure needs to be standard, just we need also to find a way how we will also regularly update this kind of document because even the nature of our business and the challenges that we are facing are changing due to the technology. I mean, when we started drafting a code of conduct, we started from one point of view today, after two, day, two years, I can say that we have a quite a different challenges, especially now when we see that, for example, open banking is starting, how we will use this data, especially if we are expected to share the data for AML responsible gambling purposes from open banking, for example. There are many numerous concerns that we need to be able to capture in this kind of um, self-regulatory instruments, yes. Thank you. Um, Janika, one last comment from your end. Yes, I'm, I'm conscious of the timer, the huge timer they placed in front of us. Um, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it finally being approved. I think it will be a step towards uh, leveling up the compliance of the industry. I'm also conscious of the fact that, exactly as Adriana said, things are constantly changing. And I understand that the industry will always find better and improved ways of complying with the GDPR and applying it to the industry. So I really look forward to it being approved and I, I encourage all operators to sign up to it once it is. Thank you. Ian? So yes, um, I confirm that uh, we have been approached by Egba last year. Um, uh, and uh, actually, if, you, if one were to read the first line of Article 4, 40 of the GDPR, um, uh, it specifically sets out that uh, member states, sorry, supervisory authorities, but not only, also member states uh, should be encouraged, uh, should encourage the industry and controllers to develop codes of conduct. So we are indeed happy that we were approached, I mean, because ECBA chose um, our, our uh, authority for the purposes of proceeding with the approval process. It will be a, a long process because uh, uh, given that uh, there is the, the processing uh, of data happening in, an, in, a, in various member states, uh, the, the code will have to go to the consistency mechanism in terms of Article 63 and 64 of the GDPR. So, once that we receive, because until now we have received only the, the, the first draft, we are waiting from EGBA for the final draft because we can, before we can proceed um, uh, and initiate the procedure within the EDPB structures because we have to go through the structures of the EDPB in order to, for the code to be reviewed and then ultimately an opinion will be issued by the board, by the European Data Protection Board. After that, opinion will be issued, it will be forwarded to the European Commission, and then if the European Commission considers that there is a, 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 a general applicability of the code within the Union, then it will adopt it by means of an implemented, implementing measure. So that is the way ahead, um, uh, as far in so far as our office is concerned as well. In the meantime, um, we have uh, and we are waiting for an opinion by the European Data Protection Board concerning the requirements for accreditation, because as part of the code um, uh, of conduct, um, there should be, I mean, it, there may be, because the wording of the GDPR is a may, not a shell, but in the first draft that we have, um, EGBA have decided to appoint a monitoring body, and the scope of the monitoring body is uh, indeed 
to, ha to overview the compliance with, uh, by members who sign to the code of conduct with the contents of the, conduct, of the, of the code. So uh, we will be um, receiving the opinion by the board on these accreditation requirements for the accreditation of the monitoring body, in this case um, uh, of the uh, code of conduct which has been presented by, by ECBA. And so um, uh, that will start the process which I am envisaging will take uh, a good number of months. But first we need to, to receive because we are not stopping the process. So uh, we, are we are waiting EGBA to give us the final draft. So once that we receive it, we kickstart the process from there. Because from there, it will be a long way until the code is ultimately um, uh, adopted uh, by the European Commission. Thank you, Ian. Um, our time was up five minutes ago. So one last short comment from Gordon and we'll wrap up. Sure, sure, yes. I think that in general, having a framework to stick to something that you can make reference to is really important. It makes life easier for everyone. Um, all of the involved parties, be it controllers, be it processors, um, always helpful. So definitely, yes, it would help. Thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for joining us.